Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're moving on to our next session where we're going to talk about AI and finance and ethical considerations. Um, I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. My name is Trista Bridges. I am co-founder of an organization called Read the Air. Um, we work with organizations around the topic of sustainability, and I'm also an author of a book um, on a similar topic. And so what we want to do today is we want to talk about um, not just about AI, but um, ethics and how ethics um, is impacted uh, by AI and our transition to working with this new and emerging tech technology. We have three very interesting and very uh, exciting panelists with us today. Um, the first is in the studio with me now. Uh, that's Mr. Makoto Shibata, Shibata-san. Uh, we also have David Hardoon, who is joining us, who will be joining us, uh, will be joining us uh, out, of, out of the studio, actually, um, uh, by Zoom. And we also have Daniel Libo, uh, who will be joining us as well. And I would like to start with an introduction from Shibata-san. If each person could give an introduction, please. Right. S thank you for the kind introduction. Mm -hmm. So I'm Makoto Shibata, uh, head of uh, Finolab. So Finolab is a fintech hub where we have like 50 startup members and we are trying to uh, support them to uh, scale. And also we have uh, 16 corporate members and we try to uh, connect these uh, corporates to startups and um, try to uh, help their open innovation um, initiatives. And before becoming um, Finolab, I have been in the digital banking area for many years. So today I think I can uh, comment from both sides about AI, from startup side and also the corporate or commercial banking side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to go to our participants who are joining us remotely. Um, if we could ask Mr. David Hardoon to introduce himself, please. Hi, and uh, good, well, late afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm David Hardoon. I'm currently the Senior Advisor for Data and Artificial Intelligence at Union Bank of the Philippines. I was previously the first Chief Data Officer and Special Advisor at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Thanks so much for joining us. And finally, uh, Mr. Daniel Libo. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Libo. I say hi from Singapore as well. Um, I'll I'll not talk about you know kindergarten till now because we don't have we're pressed for time. But I guess the main reason why I'm here is that last year I had the pleasure to contribute a chapter to a book called the AI book, and basically the uh, the topic of today is a almost one to one match with the chapter that we wrote. So we started thinking a little bit about the important considerations of uh, ethical principles in the context of financial markets. Great. Thank you so much. What we want to do as we get started is to really talk about ethics in the sense of, you know, we want to make sure we're all on the same page about what we mean when we say ethics. <laughs> so um, I know, Dan, you mentioned the book that you contributed to. There was a very helpful framework that you had for thinking about that, and it includes five key principles. Fairness, privacy, transparency, explainability, and accountability. And I know in particular that David, I understand that you've worked a lot about this around this explainability topic. So maybe if we could start with you, Dan, you know, tell us a little bit about that framework and what eth ethics means in a financial context. Sure. So, so um, uh, in a very cheeky fashion, I basically um, built on top of David's work, right? Because David has. Uh, amongst other regulators, uh, has built a framework and, and has done a lot of thinking about how uh, or which ethical principles really matter in the context of finance. And then I tried to operationalize some of these um, some of these principles together with my co-author Tiffany. And um, the main idea is really to give financial markets practitioners. Um, a bit of a head start on how to approach these different topics because principles like, for example, fairness are arguably as old as the financial markets themselves, right? And depending on who you talk to, it's quite interesting. You know, some, some very experienced practitioners say, well, it's so difficult for humans to act fairly, for example. How are machines ever going to understand that, right? It's impossible. 
um, you have other experts that say, well, we have so many agency issues in the markets. In fact, mm -hmm. if we don't start using uh, AI and machine learning, we're never going to make any progress. So when we heard these two kind of opposing views, we said that is a very good uh, topic to write a book chapter on because if there's controversy, then uh, it's an interesting discussion, right? So, so that was kind of the main driver on why we started investigating this topic. But the idea was really to say, okay, let's try and um, pragmatically break down what these principles really mean in the context of a trading floor, right? I'm the head of the trading floor. Now somebody says to me, well, if you want to use a machine learning algorithm, it better be explainable. What does that even mean, right? So that's the kind of the kind of angle. Yeah. Maybe if I can jump in for a second, uh, uh, given the, the plug that Dan has given me. Thank you very much, Dan. So well, now it's more than three years ago, um, uh, back in the MS days, we, we basically found that there was, there was there was a gap in the marketplace, specifically in the financial sector, where there was no underlying baseline. and and. As mentioned, it's nothing new. I mean, having a fiduciary responsibility for your customers has always been there from a financial operator. But suddenly looking at data and AI was, well, what can we do, what we cannot do? And regulators at large have been deliberately quiet about it. So we decided, look, we need to put in place a set of guidelines, a set of principles to help you know, put a, even loose, but a perimeter. And that was effectively the fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Now, that, as mentioned, was indeed with the objective of setting in place a perimeter considerations. And in fact, if anything, uh, a realization that a lot of the governance and the requirements had effectively already been in place. But and, and this is where I actually should thank Dan and, and co-authors of the book and everything. We deliberately didn't focus on the operationalization. So it was about these are the principles. Now you need to figure out how to operationalize it, knowing that it's going to be a tough thing. But that then re required that next step of realizing, well, actually, we already are operationalizing. Oh, this is how we operate, operationalize in this context. This is how we make it relevant and results in not just talking about AI, not just theorizing about it, but truly using it. Mm -hmm. And, and Shibata-san, can I ask you your yeah. thoughts on this? Are there any parts of this framework for you that seem particularly problematic where you see problems could arise? Right. Now we are seeing many uh, large corporates trying to introduce uh, what they call uh, AI guideline or AI principles or AI policies and particularly technology companies were um, first to start but we also see some of the global banks um, starting to introduce uh, these uh, principles and maybe they uh, read uh, Dan's book AI book um, I've seen all of these five principles uh, put into place. And one bank commented that they are also introducing um, one area called security or safety uh, as another principle. So th they would like to uh, make sure that um, uh, adopting AI does not um, give extra risk to a customer or also to uh, uh, employees. So I think um, we are covering um, very basics right now, but um, we are starting to have discussion on uh, what to uh, cover with these uh, principles. Okay. And Dan and David, are there any parts of this framework where you see there being more problems than other parts? Where are the really sticky, <laughs> difficult challenging areas um, for financial organizations to, to that the financial organizations will need to deal with? Oh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll take a quick stab and then feel free to take a sure. bit. But the, the first one I would say is, and, and we're coming to a realization this internationally, is ethics. Um, where while there are certain underlying um, globally agreeable uh, predicates and presumptions, that there is local, there's culture specificities. And I'm being very delicate in dancing around this topic and not specifying what is right, what is wrong, but it's a cultural, um, well, respect actually to a certain degree. And, and this is challenging because if you're a global operator, not even global, regional, and you're going about building an AI model and you're embedding within it whatever principles that you have, whatever governance that you have, 
how do you assure that it can now be operated across multiple regions within within the region or internationally? Now that becomes tricky. That, that becomes difficult because maybe what you're trying to do is everything's fine, not not an issue from a from a governance perspective, from an ethical point of view within your specific context, but it doesn't work somewhere else. So that, do we now have this fragmentation of models that it has to be ultra specific, or do we come to a universal consensus? It, I, I would say this one is, in, at least in my personal point of view, slightly more problematic than the others, which are, are more mechanical and more technical in nature. Okay. Dan, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I mean, if we had more time, wow, there are so many important things, but maybe I zoom in a little bit on this whole uh, topic of transparency, right? And if we kind of go back to the uh, to the definition of what transparency actually is, is really um making sure that the the public understands how ai actually works right and how it aligns with their version of of reality and this is obviously a very um important topic in the context of financial markets because you now have on the one side uh, perhaps the fund managers who are pitching their machine machine learning based uh, funds to their clientele and they are arguably very excited about that and then on the other side you have perhaps the client that uh, buys into that idea um, but also doesn't really understand how some of these algorithms work right and then there have been cases where there's big disappointment right so i think in, in 2018 we had a case where uh, in Hong Kong, a fund lost about $20 million worth of uh, investor money. And of course, mm. what did the investor do? Well, they sued the fund and said, you know, that's that's not what you told me this ma miraculous machine learning algorithm was going to do. So I think uh, if you think about it from that angle, basically there are, there are things to be done on both sides, right? So um, should um, there be a lot more disclosures by the fund on how these machine learning algorithms work. Yes, there should be. But at the same time, it's a little bit like a, a buyer beware kind of a concept, right? So what can we do on the educational side to enable uh, investors to understand the fundamentals of machine learning so that they can take better decisions when they do their due diligence, right? It's almost like uh, in the past, uh, I remember exchanges were very well known to explain to the public how derivatives work, right? This is a call option, this is a put option. Well, maybe we need to do the same thing, right? This is a, the, this is a, a neural network, this is, um, uh, I don't know, a random forest. You know, we, we have to explain these basics so that people can take more informed decisions. So I think um, transparency and then education uh, aligned to that is, is probably a very, very important uh, part of the equation. Very interesting. Can I add oh, sorry, word? of course, you've got some, please. Yeah, I fully agree to uh, my fellow panelists. And also, uh, as David mentioned, this issue of uh, operating in different um, jurisdiction is a big challenge, especially now privacy is uh, something that uh, different um, jurisdiction mm -hmm. have their own views on privacy. So the global financial institution uh, are trying to find out where would be a good ground to uh, use privacy as um, principle in AI. And I think these things would take some time to be solved. Interesting. Good point. I think this is all a really nice segue into the next question I want to ask, which is around accountability. So we've obviously had many periods of history where financial markets have had massive problems, disruptions. Um, for example, what we had in 2008. And that really destroyed a lot of the um, trust, I would say, um, in, in financial markets at that time and also afterwards. And the question of accountability loomed large in a lot of those problems and we still, those, those situations. And we still have a lot of questions around, well, who is accountable and who was accountable? Who should be made accountable and how should we do that? If we struggle to do that with human beings, how can we imagine this working with you know, AI? You know, how do we get around the question of accountability when the AI goes rogue, if you will? Who is accountable for that and who should be accountable for that? I'm happy for any of the panelists to address that question. 
Oh, I'll, I'll take uh, whoever wants to. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> no, Dan, go ahead. You, you jumped in. Dan, please. you go first. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. So, so accountability, very, very interesting, very interesting topic, actually. And um, I guess I want to start with something that is probably not what <laughs> many want to hear. Um, in the realm of financial markets, um, technologies are not regulated, right? And um, the activities that financial services companies, or, or in particular, the participants in the markets conduct, those are the activities that are regulated. And um, those rely with the executives and, and ultimately with the CEO of the entity that, that uh, is in question, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one, one principle that I kind of wanted to get across, actually, I was very excited uh, about uh, saying this in public, is um, I really don't believe that we should regulate machine learning algorithms more than we regulate humans. Because I think that can really stifle innovation and is, is a quite dangerous thing to do. So let me just illustrate really briefly uh, before I hand over to my federal panelists um, how to think about this. So let's just say that something goes wrong with a machine learning algorithm. In fact, that is very comparable to a a rogue trader on the trading floor that basically doesn't follow the compliance handbook and sees this once in a lifetime opportunity and has you know tunnel vision and thinks he has to execute this trade because that's going to make his career forever right so so these um uh, these two are very very comparable and when a client of this particular company loses money they will not sue this individual trader you know they will still sue the employer and maybe the employer fires the, the, um, the employee, but that's a different thing, right? From a client perspective, it will always be um, the company that they contract with that is accountable. This is very important, right? Whether it's machine learning or human, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Now, uh, let's go one step further and think a little bit about what should we then do uh, in the context of machine learning algorithms. So I think, as we all know, uh, the data that we feed machine learning algorithms is really key and will then determine the behavior. So if we keep that in mind, I think we should really have uh, very strong data policies that basically um, help us to continuously stress test and scenario test uh, these algorithms uh, versus the market. Um, so that we have some sort of boundary condition about uh, um, what these algorithms can do and cannot do, right? And if we have that, it will enable executives to um, uh, take their accountability that they have on paper uh, in a much in a much better fashion. If I if I may, so um, I'll partially or half agree with that, and just for the sake of not disagreeing <laughs> on everything. <laughs> all, all the time. So so let me start with the the, the part which I. I've been, or parts, I say, agree a bit less. So you mentioned something about regulating of, of algorithms. I've been a strong supporter for the longest time, and not just because I worked for a regulator for several years, but we've come of age where we need a data regulator. We need someone who looks at the implications of data, and something that you were alluding to, I think, at the end, Dan, uh, with respect to privacy, but beyond privacy, really kind of getting an understanding of these underlying replications and impacts that algorithms and AI may result. So someone who's asking those hard questions of should we do it versus can we do it and looking at the implication of systemic risk. But this is something that sits across industries. And this is why it's, uh, I half agree. So we need that. What we don't need is a financial regulator regulate, regulating technology. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, in my personal view, industry regulators should not cross those boundaries because that's when you get um, good intentions going rogue in my personal point of view, whereby you suddenly get this overstipulation on how the technology operates when trying to achieve a certain objective. And it does, and I'll give you a very simple example, uh, cloud, that, oh, we need to localize data and therefore data can come out of the country, but then within 24 hours has to be deleted. I mean, any technologist will tell you that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That in fact will increase operational risk tremendously. So that's kind of what we need to have the boundaries. Now, also to your, to your question, Trista, about still, how do we boil this down in terms of accountability? Because we, this doesn't run away. And how do we create this or pass this bridge 
from human to machine. Um, in the end of the day, and I actually I love the analogy again earlier, it's, it's the accountability of the firm, it's the accountability of the CEO of what's being done used. And just like we have Teslas or self-driving or partially self or assistant driving vehicles on the road, we have established the supply chain of every single step from the manufacture of the metal to the person who puts the bolts in place, to the design of the car, to the design of the engine, to the all the way to the distributor to finally as a consumer. Now, I would love to say I fully understand the mechanics of a Tesla. I approximately do, but that doesn't mean I can't use it because that supply chain is in place. And I know that if something goes wrong, whatever element it may be, even if it's I made the mistake, there is an ability to identify and address that aspect of accountability. So we should not look like, oh, no, we don't know where it sits, therefore we shouldn't do it because of accountability. It's more we need to apply the existing frameworks and the existing supply chain of, because we have data scientists, we have the modelers, we have the uh, business developers, the line managers. So we have all those principles in, in stage. I, to me, this concept of algorithm go wrong or we didn't know what it's doing, it's just, just bizarre. <laughs> Shibata-san, any thoughts on this question of accountability? Yeah, um, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, um, several uh, global bankers on, the, on this issue. And one um, challenge that uh, one bank um, mentioned was uh, they are having an AI governance issue on the, the Sarbanes-Oxley, SOX. Um, so they have a strict uh, process to uh, uh, meet the SOX requirements, but the auditors are not quite happy once uh, they bring in AI into certain uh, process. And now they are still in, in the argument and they, they haven't got the, the conclusion, but for temporary solution, they just uh, decided that uh, someone uh, in the bank would uh, just say yes after the AI result comes out so that the um, auditor can say such and such person made a decision based on s AI. So if it's a full automated process, um, the auditor doesn't know who to be accountable for. So I think mm -hmm. that kind of uh, pro problem would arise uh, from now on, talking about the, the governance and the, the internal um, control. It's interesting, so it's somewhat of a back office clearing function, if you will, for an AI oriented transaction. That's kind of an interesting approach. But can, can I just jump in and, I, and, and I, I love that, that analogy, but because this in a way to me is also a bit of a warning. Because humans are the most phenomenal in hacking any system, including human systems. And we need to be careful whereby we're putting things in place just to appease an auditor, whereby it's just to appease, and you know, what I call tick the box compliance. This is where everyone in the table, the auditors, the compliance, the regulator, the business, need to really kind of sit down and go, well, let's open it up and let's rethink what we're trying to achieve. Because we don't have a situation where we put layers yet something happens, and we don't know what actually happened. Yeah. I, I guess to also complement, right, I think one one key thing that could be perhaps, you know, from where we are right now, tick, tick box compliance to to this conversation that, uh, that David just mentioned, we have to think along the lines of uh, probability and severity of things going wrong, right? And mm -hmm. Um, not every decision that is perhaps influenced by some uh, machine learning output uh, falls into the same quadrant, if you like, if you think about, you know, probability and severity as this little matrix. Um, there are things that are perhaps uh, um, more acceptable to get wrong to a small level of probability. And there are some that you can absolutely not get wrong and you need to justify to others why you decided in a certain way, right? So um, to, to take a black and white kind of a decision on these matters is, uh, is also uh, stopping innovation because there are a lot of decisions that humans take every day where we can reap the benefits immediately, right? It's just 
a few of them uh, perhaps need that additional layer of control until we have properly figured out how to manage these things in, uh, in real time. Great, very interesting. I, I want to switch gears just a little bit because we're talking a little bit about you know, technology and, and different types of processes we can use. I want to talk a little bit about innovation itself. And so, um, Shibata san you talked about in your introduction about Finolab and some of the things that you're doing there. You obviously work with a lot of startups uh, and small businesses. And obviously, thinking about things like ethics early on can be very challenging for mm -hmm. them. They're, they're just trying to kind of hack a problem and kind of find a solution. How are they thinking about this? Are you it, introducing this concept or these ideas, these watch outs, early on in their development process? And are they, they building this into how they develop the products and services that they develop? Right. Um, I've been talking to uh, um, many startups how they uh, consider AI in their uh, business process. And firstly, uh, we have to be very careful because uh, if we have like a pitch contest, maybe 80% um, of the startup would claim that uh, they're using AI in one place <laughs> or another. And maybe um, if you ask several questions, you just find out that uh, it's a simple rule-based engine that they are applying. And I think there are a mixed approach um, in terms of uh, business areas. And if you are exposed to uh, a risk in one way or another, like um, if you're building a KYC, e KYC engine or AML detection uh, engine or uh, cybersecurity um, uh, solutions, I think they are quite aware of what is the, the issue, um, not just the risk, but also the ethical issues. But if you are building something like a chatbot using AI or um, recommendation engine, um, it's highly likely that they are not well aware of the, the, the issues coming in. So we are trying to uh, communicate with uh, different <coughs> players um, in different levels, and we want to make sure that they recognize certain um, issues at the front. But I think this is a uh, very challenge area, challenging area. As uh, Dan mentioned, uh, innovation is a key thing, but um, at the same time, we, we want to make sure that uh, they won't uh, bring in um, unethical um, solution from the beginning. Absolutely. David, what are you seeing? You've obviously worked in a couple of different ecosystems. What, what yeah. are you seeing around this, this question of startups and innovation and ethics? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a challenging one because a lot of times there's this perspective of if we look at the whole fairness, ethics, consideration, it's going to stifle inf innovation. On the other hand, I need to do innovation. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't know whether it's the, the years that I spent in the regulator, but I've kind of believe strongly that it's not a seesaw. It's not a case of either or. It is a matter that can be concurrently explored. It's not easy. It requires at times a more in-depth conversation, but it's something that can absolutely be done concurrently in driving innovation. And in fact, leveraging on these principles, on these guidelines, on this governance, to seed even more innovation. And to give you a very simple example, when we came up with these feed principles, uh, the feedback was, you know, there's nothing about finance about it. And that was exactly the intention. It should be applicable to every single company out there, whether it's a startup or a big tech organization, because at the end of the day, when we start touching with people's data and we're building sophisticated algorithms, and we, we can talk, because uh, I fully agree that uh, AI is a bit too much of a marketing uh, uh, tag, so there's a degree of a sophistication. But nonetheless, using algorithms to extract information and insight, we all have a fiduciary responsibility to people and customers whether or not a regulator exists. It, it, I, I always like to say you don't need a regulator to tell you to do the right thing. So it's kind of taking that mindset of we want to explore, we can have a, 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 a I don't want to use the word sandbox approach, but a more confined environment in terms of doing this kind of experimentation while making sure that at least the best possible effort 
that things don't go wrong. And just to add one more point, because it's also a bit of a philosophy that I have and also adopting in the organization I'm with right now, is, and I know this may sound a bit counterintuitive, is actually, to me, AI will make mistakes. You know, things will go wrong. We will have discrimination. We'll have algorithms going bananas. But it's less about the algorithm per se going wrong. It's whether or not we have the safeguards that are able to catch that. So just because an algorithm says, I have a recommendation or I have a certain decision that needs to be done, that's fine. We can actually have a secondary layer around it that can help us validate those decisions by saying, are these things that are we okay with? And in fact, uh, going slightly, slightly borderline pseudo-psychological, it mimics us. We actually, whenever we make a decision, we make two decisions. We make the decision, and then we have a ethical governance procedure on top of it as to whether or not we can proceed with that underlying decision or thought that we've had essentially. And that's in a way where AI needs to mature, specifically for startups in realizing that we need to have a bit of a separation of the innovation, the capabilities, the algorithmic development, and then that additional layer, whether it's automated, machine, or human, to assuring that governance and responsibility to customers. Great. Dan, thoughts? Um, yes, I have one, actually. <laughs> and um, I, I kind of borrow a little bit from Kai Fu Lee's book. Uh, Kai Fu Lee, you know, the gentleman who used to run Google in, in China um, and now a very successful entrepreneur, thought a lot about AI. And um, what what he said once is is fascinating. He said, in the past, machine learning was very much a research type of a topic. You needed a bunch of PhDs somewhere locked away in the basement to figure out what to do, and it was a very niche application, right? And, and then now we basically moved into, out of this research um, kind of um, area, uh, we moved towards implementation. Because right now, so, you, you know, you look at all the Python libraries, they're basically there for anyone to grab and to apply to any problem that we want, right? So if your question is about innovation and how that all hangs together, to me, actually, especially machine learning is, is a particular area that offers larger financial services institution a lot of opportunity for innovation. Because it was, it has never been so easy to use this general purpose technology and apply it to problems that you want to, to resolve, whether that is in markets or, or other parts of, of the banking ecosystem. So, so I think that is, is a great enabler. And while I'm a big fan of all sorts of uh, startup methods like agile and design thinking and all of that, I also do think that you need a bit of a turbo booster to create something of value. And, and I think machine learning can be that, um, whether you are in a, in a small venture or whether you are in a very large multinational bank. Okay, great, thanks for that insight. One of the things that we often um, like to talk about is application. And so which applications, AI in a financial context, will be the mo you find to be the most promising, right? I think we automatically think of consumer applications, right, you know, whether it be credit decisions, or it be banking type operations, but there's obviously lots of places within financial, within financial markets that we can use AI. And I'd like to hear from each of you, what do you think some of the most promising uh, innovations could be, and things that you may have seen? And then as a follow-up to that, what are the biggest ethical considerations around that particular application? So maybe Dan, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, so because I have this financial markets background, I'm just going to continue to talk about financial markets. Um, but what I what I want to highlight here is, is actually fascinating. Um, I think one or two years ago, some really smart researchers have empirically proven that investment managers who make use of machine learning principles can understand expected returns better than the ones that can't. And that was a bit of a mouthful, but you think about it, it's quite a substantial insight, right? It basically says, if there are two companies that look exactly the same, have a very high quality team members, have great client base, uh, fantastic geographical uh, distributed presence, the only difference is one is really good with machine learning and then the other one not, they have a bit of an edge, right? Uh, one that you cannot really uh, outperform if you, do, you, if you don't have it. So I think... Uh, if you ask me about uh, opportunities, then obviously using machine learning 
uh, principles and, and algorithms in the financial markets, whether that is for um, managing risk or trying to find new opportunities that perhaps humans have not uh, managed to, to understand so far, is a, is a very, very large um, sphere where we can, where we can uh, do interesting things. Okay. Shibata-san, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I guess uh, talking to uh, uh, bankers, uh, lending area is something that uh, we see a mm. lot of application coming out, uh, whether it's a uh, consumer loan or um, uh, mortgage or uh, loan for uh, SMEs, and especially now with the pandemic, um, the, the s smaller um, enterprises are applying for uh, um, relief loans, and they find it quite helpful to get the result uh, using uh, AI. And I guess in applying these uh, uh, AI tools for uh, lending, um, we also face a um, challenge for uh, privacy, especially for consumer loan or mortgage. And I think in US, they have a big discussion on um, racial issue, but here in Japan, um, the bankers are concerned about the, the the nationality and also the the gender issue uh, in terms of um, making uh, um, machine learning from the past uh, creative decision. And I think uh, we would see more um, um, check on these uh, discussions from from now on. Great, very interesting. And David, thoughts from you? So, so perhaps maybe not the most uh, exciting of areas, but I actually think right now, and, and this is largely due to the fact that I'm absolutely obsessed with operationalizing AI, I find that the most exciting to me area and most uh, uh, promising area is actually applying AI in ops, in, ops, in operations. Um, and the benefit for that is actually twofold. Uh, one, if I go in reverse and what you were mentioning, some of the challenges from an ethical consideration is due to the nature of being in operations are actually quite minimized because it's really about looking at the back and the middle office of the organization and how to uh, maximize whatever efficiency can be great. And that's exactly where AI you know, triumphs because it finds of a reams of data, those subtleties that as a human you may not be able to or unable to see, um, or maybe just too busy to see, so that's one. And the second one is the return on investment is just, I mean, the moment you start doing it, you, it, it it's just it's jaw dropping and it then encourages and motivates the more front office, the more kind of cell related type of AI activities and customer, which as we've kind of been discussing, also has uh, certain additional types of considerations and concerns of the you know, uh, privacy and, and, and disadvantagement and so forth. So to me, really, right now, while it not, may not be the most innovative, is ops. Because there's a huge amount of efficiencies that can be still gained in the existing system. Very interesting. Thanks so much. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do before we close, because I think we have about five minutes left, we, we talked a little bit about regulators actually throughout this discussion. And I'm curious, I'm just curious as to what you're seeing from regulators around the world, right? Because I imagine there's some differences in terms of how this is being thought of and addressed. Are you seeing any trends or any interesting things that, uh, that you think could be uh, interesting uh, for other markets to take on? And maybe, I think, uh, David, you actually worked in a regulator. So can you talk about that just quickly before we close off? Well, I, I think for regulators, and again, I don't, I don't, this is from a personal perspective, I think this was a bit of an a, rec a reckoning. Because if you look at traditional, not just financial markets, just markets, uh, the, the way in which they move, the way in which they progress and advance, is we're talking about decades. And regulators usually you know, have the ability and the luxury of, building policies, doing stress tests, you know, thinking about things, mulling them before coming out. And the reality of the world of data and AI is, is the sheer veracity of activities. By the time a regulator comes out with a policy, it's, it's irrelevant. The industry has already moved on to the next thing. 
So there's a lot of um, coming up to speed of how does and regulators actually adapt and adopt this exact same technology, exact same capabilities, perhaps not for trading on the exchange, but being able to understand and monitor the trades on the exchange to make sure there's no manipulation, et cetera, and so forth, as just one hypothetical example. So that then also means pragmatically that a regulator is needs to kind of bring on board people who are technical, who are not traditional even finance or traditional policy uh, or traditional supervised regulators. For example, take myself as a good example. I'm, I'm neither a finance person nor a supervisor, <laughs> but I joined a regulator to do exactly that, bring internally this mindset and perspective of how to use technology. But this is still a, a learning process, and you're finding that regulators internationally are slowly starting to do that. My only perhaps message outwards is not fast enough. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> okay, Dan, do you want to have a quick word, and then we'll have Shibata san kind of close us off. Sure, I'll I'll keep it really short this time around. So, when we did the research for our book chapter, basically we started looking at uh, all of the regulation that's out there uh, globally, and of course, MAS in Singapore with David at the front uh, took a bit of a leading position there. But what was very comforting to us was that wherever you actually go, there are now frameworks around the ethical use of AI in finance, right? So whether it's in Hong Kong, where there's an ethical accountability framework, or the European Union has a ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Singapore obviously has multiple documents by now. Uh, what, what is perhaps a little bit of a surprise, or at least was to us when we first did the research, is that even in China, there is are the so-called Beijing AI principles. And the comforting thing is, it's all the same. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> you know, uh, plus minus, right? There, there, there might be one principle that is covered in one jurisdiction, not the other. But um, there is good consensus around what ethical AI is, which I think is a very uh, comforting and, and encouraging uh, status that we have reached so far. Very interesting. Pakistan, please. Yes, I agree with David. And I think it's now becoming uh, quite open in the way that the regulators are trying to uh, share their information about AI and how they approach AI ethics uh, uh, within different um, jurisdictions and also um, they are quite open to learn from what startups are doing and also the the banks are doing uh, for example uh, Bank of Japan here in Japan are now um, organizing um, several series of uh, AI workshops and also FSA financial service agency are conducting uh, interviews to uh, uh, different startups uh, adopting uh, new AI solutions. So I think it's a quite healthy attitude. So uh, we have to uh, uh, monitor that so we can share that um, in different uh, community. And I think uh, this uh, opportunity of uh, Singapore FinTech Festival is a good uh, chance to exchange ideas uh, between Asian regulators and the Asian financial institution. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's a great point to close on. I want to thank um, all of our panelists today for joining us and certainly for our audience for joining us as well. I think it was a very interesting discussion. AI, we're going to see it increasingly a part of our lives and a part of how we work. And of course, eth ethics is a very important uh, consideration when thinking about innovation and development in this important area. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank, thank you for much. having us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.